Sound design. So why did I decide to set up the subwoofers this way at the recent Minneapolis Jazz Fest in St. Paul? And how did I prepare for the crossover alignment? So let's take a look. I made a little model in Map3D and you can see I've got the main audience area here, the stage here, and this little VIP section here. So when I got there the first day, this is how the subs were set up. Uh, here's the mains, by the way. And I think the subs were set up like this because they were just spaced evenly across the front, right? And what is the problem with this? Well, there's not really a big problem at 63 hertz, except that you are going to have very narrow coverage. Why? Because the line is so long. So at 63 hertz, you're still coupled, but you can see you've, you have very narrow coverage now. It looks like this ice pick just coming out like that. And you'll see that as we go up in frequency, that the pattern will start to fall apart. Uh, because they're spaced too far apart. So they're spaced uh, about 12.6 feet apart right now. So if we divide the speed of sound by 12.67 feet, you can see that that gives us 89 hertz. And if we multiply that by two thirds to see our upper limit, we can see that it's actually 59.60. Um, but it's most obvious when we get up here, let me change this to one third octave smoothing. When we get up here to about 100 hertz, you'll see how this starts to fall apart because now we break apart into all of these little side lobes. You might not have a problem with this, that's fine, but my personal preference is to try to keep these closer together, keep them coupled up to a higher frequency and also have wider coverage because this is my audience here, but I really would prefer to have 180 degree coverage because this is in a park. And although you can sit here, there are people, you know, all the way around in front of the stage here. So this is the first thing I decided to do. And the reason is because the instructions I understood were that we needed to try to keep sub energy off of the VIP area. And I thought that this little section here was the VIP area. Um, so I made this four element gradient array and rotated them out. And you see if I go back to 63 Hertz here and just select one of these groups, um, that it works pretty well in steering the energy away from the center. Let's go to the top view. So this is a nice array to get really narrow directional coverage. And this way I can steer it away from the center section, which is what I thought I needed to do. Now I found out later that the VIP section is actually this section back here. And I said, oh, I think I can come up with a better solution. My limitations here are that number one, I would like to continue to use all eight of the subwoofers mostly just because I don't want to have to answer people's questions about why I'm not using all of them, but also because I'm not really sure what the um, power ratio is between main and sub. And so I don't know what will happen if I take some subs away. So I thought, you know what, let me just use the same two processing channels that are set up there. Let me just use all of the subs and see what I can do within those limitations. So what I decided to do was move all the subs to the center because remember I want a shorter line so that I can widen the coverage and I'll do an inverted gradient stack. So here's what that looks like. If I zoom in here and I turn on the center lines, then you'll see that the bottom ones are aimed forward and the rear ones are aimed to the rear. Now your two element inverted gradient stack is probably not as efficient as or easy to set up as a three element. Normally you see these, you know, with three elements um, and that works out pretty well, but you can, you can set it up with two elements just fine. You'll probably just need to do, you know, some sort of level offset. And I guess that'll affect the headroom of your system without getting into too much of a complicated discussion about that. I knew that this would at least work within the limitations that I had. So let's look at the result. So you can see that I'm successfully keeping sound off of the stage 
and off of this VIP area and still having pretty wide coverage here in the audience. If I had one more processing channel, I could have delayed, made a little delay arc here and widened this coverage out a little bit. But I looked at this and I said, you know what? This should work fine. And then I had a little microphone here to practice calibrating all of this. This is what I love about Map3D is that you can practice all of this in the software. You know, it has a measurement viewer here. So I practiced going through all these steps so I would be ready when I got into the field the next day. And here is what that looked like in the field. So here's all of the subwoofers at that alignment position on stage. I was thinking, you know, I want maximum cancellation at where there might be some vocal microphones here. And then here's what it looked like when I inserted the polarity inversion for those top subs. So I have a nice, I think like 12 to 13 dB front to back ratio here of cancellation. So I was pretty happy with that. So that's the subwoofer design. Now let's take a look at how I planned for the crossover alignment because I've got um, subwoofers from EV and I have mains from DB Technologies. I don't think these speakers are designed to work together and that's not something that I really want to be messing around with in the field, especially in the far field where I've got lots of noise and I'm trying to work quickly. So the first thing that I need is the data. I need some kind of measurement of these speakers to work with. Luckily, Tracebook had this, so I just went to tracebook.org and I searched for DB Technologies T4 and I downloaded the response and then I opened that up in Crosslight. Crosslight is an audio analyzer that I've been really enjoying recently for doing this kind of prep work and simulations for crossover alignment. So there's my main. Now, how do I get my sub? So I went over to EV and I looked around and my experience so far is that EV does not have GLL files for any of their speakers, unfortunately. Um, but I recently learned a kind of sneaky trick. I guess it's not a sneaky trick. A cool way, <laughs> a helpful tool for getting images of responses and converting an image into something you can import into your audio analyzer. So I'm not going to show you how to do that because I learned how to do it from this video from SoundKeeper. It uses another app where you can basically import that image and then export it as a transfer function. And that's what I did. And I was pretty surprised it worked pretty well. So here is the result of that work. And the cool thing is that I have the native response of the sub here so I can play around with the filters. So let's start looking at how this alignment might work. Over here in the data sheet, it says here is the hot, recommended high pass and low pass filters. So let's insert those. 12 dB per octave at 36 Hertz and then 24 dB per octave at 100 Hertz. And at first you might look at this and you might think, well, that looks fine, but I'm a little bit picky here because I see that this is going to create, you know, this potentially this kind of hump and then I'll have to equalize that out. And I would prefer to not have to do that extra work if possible. What I want is for uh, the result to be pretty flat. And so I need this area of interaction to be down lower. Let me show you what I mean. Let's turn on a target. So I've got a flat target here. And this is, you can see that my main in the low frequencies here is hitting the target. And then I'm going to turn on a delta target that is 6 dB below here. So I want the tops of the responses to be hitting here. And then I want the crossover to be down here somewhere so that when they are matched in level and matched in phase, I'll get 60B of summation and it'll hit the target. So let's see if we can do that 
At this point, you might be thinking, why don't you just put a high pass filter on your main? And I couldn't do that. I probably could have rerouted some things and figured out how to do that, but the way the system was set up when I got there is that they only had DSP processing output for the subs. So I didn't want to have to figure out how to reroute things and set up their system in a different way. So I just said, you know what? Let me make this simple on myself. I'll just leave the mains exactly how they are and I'll do what I need to do to make the sub work with the mains just in, with the mains with just its native response. So what I'm going to do here is lower this low pass filter until, you know, I can hit this negative 60B point here. Um, and I also think that the slope is not correct. Why did I, why do I think that? I haven't even looked at the phase response, but just by looking at how steep this magnitude response is, I'm pretty sure these aren't going to line up. Um, but I can prove that to you by dragging this down here and you can see they're starting to approach a match here at about 70 Hertz. And if we switch over to looking at the phase response, this is what I meant. I could already kind of predict that this red guy is going to be steeper than this green guy. So how do I create symmetrical phase slopes here? Well, the first thing I need to know is what is the slope of my main speaker? So let's go over there and measure it. So in Crosslight here, if we switch over to looking at data view pre, then I can just put filters on top of the data without actually changing it. So I'm going to put, I'm going to insert a high pass filter and I'll start at 12 dB per octave and I'll just drag this up a little bit here. And what I want to see is the response of this filter match with the response of my speaker here because I'm trying to figure out what is the slope of the speaker. Okay, so 12 dB per octave is not enough. What about 24? Um, getting closer, but still not steep enough. What about 36? Okay, that looks about right to me. So I'll say, okay, I think this is a 36 dB per octave high pass response here. So now I can go back over to my sub. And instead of a 24 dB per octave filter, I can use a 36 dB per octave filter. And now I can move that around. Oh, I need to take off the filter from the main. Bypass. Now I'll move this around until I have these two points matching at minus 60 B there. And the benefit is that now I should have matching phase slopes, which I do. They're just 180 degrees apart. So insert a polarity inversion and now they're lined up. Let's take a look at the magnitude. Let's look at the sum between them and that's looking pretty good. So I'm happy with that. And I don't know if this is going to play out this way exactly in the field, but I have done my practice here to see what it might look like. And I have an idea of what filter should work. So I just wrote down these filters. I inserted them when I got there and it did actually work out almost exactly like this. I think I just needed to lower the filters a little bit more than I had here. Um, so let me show you what that looked like. Here is the main response after I EQ'd it some and it's taking this big dip here uh, because of the floor bounce. I didn't take much care in removing in, in, you know, I probably could have moved the microphones around a little bit more to try to spread out that floor bounce, but I didn't. I was working quickly. Um, so I just had to remember in my head to kind of ignore that. Here is the sub before the polarity inversion. You can see that I have matched slope, but they're not on top of each other. So then polarity inversion, and now they're on top of each other. So that is the story of the Minneapolis Jazz Fest and why I chose this particular subwoofer array design and how I prepared for the crossover alignment. Maybe while I was talking about this, you saw some things that I could have done better. So I hope you'll comment on this video and let me know what you would have done differently to produce a different result, uh, maybe a better result. All right, thanks.
Sound Design. Live.